We welcome you here to the National Monument to the Forefathers of the American Pilgrimage 400 and a reenactment of a pilgrim church service. You may be seated. We are going to explain each part of a pilgrim church service a little bit to you so you have an idea of why we reenact it the way we do. My name is uh, Paul Jaley. I'm the president of the Plymouth Rock Foundation and the director of the American Pilgrimage 400. In the year 1612, we find the first record of a pilgrim church service that they were able to plan without any oversight or any persecution coming from the Church of England and King James. When they were free to decide how to conduct their service, a pattern arose beginning with some writings in 1612. Several homes had been purchased all near each other, and the Greensgate with Pastor John Robinson's house, they were all clustered there in Leiden, Holland. And they did so because they wanted to promise the Dutch that their elderly and those in their family would never be a burden to the Dutch society. They stated publicly and openly that it was a Christian's duty to care for their own and not expect others to do it at others' expense. This brought them into favor with the Dutch. Their Sabbath experience, once they were free, a pattern began to arise. They would open with prayer. Then there would be the reading of scripture with a brief explanation or exhortation. Beyond that, there would be the singing of psalms. When they would sing their psalms, they would line out the psalm. The leader would sing a line, everyone sing in response. Many did not have hymn books. The Ainsworth Psalter, though many owned it, was the basis of their worship, but they would line out that singing together. And that came and was drawn from the Old Testament in what was known as antiphonal singing. Then there was a sermon. And that sermon would be preached from several, one or two texts of Scripture and apply it to their present situation. Then the sacraments were taken care of, whether that would be communion on the Lord's Supper or it would be baptism. And finally, at the end, they would take a collection, which we're very tempted to do today. In the close of that service, that would be the closing. Now, you need to realize that this pattern, you should recognize it. This pattern became the pattern for all Protestant worship services in America. It began to be followed by more and more people, and it was started by the pilgrims. You need to recognize also that the pilgrim church service itself lasted three hours. We're going to really be short today compared to that. And the sermon itself was an hour and a half to two hours, and I like reminding my own congregation of that fact. But the point is simply this, that a pilgrim church service conducted in the morning from about nine to noon, everyone had prepared their meals ahead of time to honor the Sabbath and the Lord's Day, and then they would have an afternoon service from about 1.30 or 2 to 5. And in the afternoon service, Heads of households would get up and testify what they learned from the morning sermon and how they were going to apply it at home. That's not a bad idea either. And now, to give you a little background to the Pilgrim Progress, which you just saw, I want to welcome Cheryl Doherty. She's the director of the Pilgrim Progress here in Plymouth. I'd like to welcome all of you to our reenactment of a Pilgrim Church service, also known as the Pilgrim Progress here in the town of Plymouth. This year, the Pilgrim Progress is celebrating its 100-year anniversary. It's not the usual route we take up to Forefathers Monument, but we thought that we'd like to give you a little taste of what takes place every Friday in August 
in Plymouth and on Thanksgiving morning. Our service, as Paul said, is a very short service, nothing compared to what it was like for the pilgrims. Again, a little taste of what it was like. We consider it an honor to keep this part of the pilgrim story alive. In fact, this is a very big part of their story. This reenactment represents the faith of the pilgrims, which is why the pilgrims came here in the first place. Now the Pilgrim Progress is based upon an actual historical account. Um, it was written by a man named Isaac de Razier. He was a Dutch visitor to the Plymouth Colony in 1627. He was a secretary of the Dutch Colony in New Netherlands. In his account, one of the things he described was how the pilgrims gathered for worship. The pilgrims did not gather this way in 1621. Obviously, they were in survival mode. Half the number had died. But they did keep the Sabbath holy, always, despite their circumstances. When we reenact the pilgrim progress, each participant represents one of the 51 survivors of that first harsh winter when half the number died. So we are reenacting a 1627 historical eyewitness account using a 1621 cast of pilgrims. Um, I just want to read to you the account that um, we base this on. This was written by Isaac de Razia, who visited the colony. This is his description of the pilgrims gathering for worship. Upon the hill, they have a large square house. The lower part they use for their church, where they preach on Sundays in the usual holidays. They assemble by beat of drum, each with musket or firelock, in front of the captain's door. They have their cloaks on and place themselves in order, three abreast, and are led by a sergeant without beat of drum. Behind comes the governor in a long robe, Beside him, on the right hand, comes the preacher with his cloak on, and on the left hand, the captain with his side arms and cloak on, and with a small cane in his hand. And so they march in good order, and each sets his arms down near him. Thus, they are constantly on their guard, night and day. Now the idea for the Pilgrim Progress took place a hundred years ago when a woman named Mrs. Richard Morgan was reading the oration given by Daniel Webster a hundred years earlier at the 200 year anniversary of the landing. In the oration, he exclaimed how moving it would be if, if, one, if one could see for a moment the pilgrims as they lived. It was then that Mrs. Morgan came up with the idea and that moment eventually became the Pilgrim Progress. Now the Pilgrim Progress was instituted by the town of Plymouth as part of the 300 year anniversary of the landing of the Pilgrims. In 1921, a great pageant on the waterfront in Plymouth, which there was a great pageant, which also featured a pageant parade entitled A Pilgrim Progress. This Pilgrim Progress continued for the next 100 years with the exception of a few years during World War II. Rose Briggs, who is considered the mother of the Pilgrim Progress by many, wrote an article in the Old Colony Memorial, which is our local newspaper, during the 350 year anniversary of the landing of the Pilgrims. She writes, this year, the 350th anniversary of the landing of the Pilgrims will be the 50th anniversary of a simple ceremony held in their honor annually in Plymouth since the 300th celebration of the landing. The Pilgrim Progress was instituted by the town of Plymouth as part of the tercentenary celebration held in Plymouth from De December 21st, 1920 to December 1st, 1921. They had a year long celebration. It represents the Pilgrim congregation on their way to church as described by an eyewitness in the early days of the settlement. The marches represent the pilgrim settlers, men, women, and children who survived the first desperate winter at Plymouth and lived to found the colony, which has proved to be a cornerstone of our nation. 
As one small candle may light a thousand, writes Governor Bradford, so the light here kindled hath shown unto many, yea, in some sort to our whole nation. She continues, the Pilgrim Progress is a simple ceremony. Each Friday in August, the pilgrims assemble by beat of drum on Coles Hill overlooking Plymouth Harbor and Plymouth Rock. As the town clock strikes five, they proceed up Leiden Street, laid out by the pilgrims 350 years ago, to the site of the Fort Meeting House on Burial Hill. Here, a short service based on extracts from pilgrim writings is held, and pilgrim psalms are sung. So, this simple tradition spoken of by Rose Briggs has continued another 50 years since this article was written, and we are now celebrating the 100-year anniversary of the Pilgrim Progress. Prayer. How did the pilgrims pray? They prayed differently. They didn't pray rote prayers. They prayed from the heart. How they felt at the moment, how God was affecting them at that moment. And in giving thanks, they didn't give thanks for everything. They gave thanks in everything. Whatever the circumstances, they turned to God and they gave thanks. Dear God of heaven, maker of heaven and earth, thank you for blessing us, even though we're here, losing half our population, but here we are. We are here standing for you, and we praise you, and we thank you for who you are. We thank you for where we are, and we thank you for blessing us, for loving us, for directing us, for keeping us whole, keeping us together. We thank you for the unity we have left with the amount of people we have with us. We praise you, God. We thank you for all you do. And we ask you to bless what we do, bless our nation, bless this community. In Jesus' name, amen. Our reading today is taken from our Geneva Bible. Acts chapter 17, verse 11. These were also more noble men than they which were at Thessalonica, which received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Now reading from Paul's letter to the Romans, Romans chapter 12, verses 3 to 5. For I say, through the grace that is given unto me, to every one that is among you, that no man presume to understand above all that which is meet to understand, but that he understand according to sobriety, as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not one office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one one another's members. Let us continue our reading from Romans chapter 12, verse 9. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave unto that which is good. Be affectioned to love one another with brotherly love. In giving honor, go one before another not slothful to do service, servant in spirit, serving the Lord, 
rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing in prayer, distributing unto the necessities of the saints, giving yourselves to hospitality. Bless them which persecute you. Bless, I say, and curse not. Rejoice with them that rejoice, and weep with them that weep. Be of like affection one towards another. Be not high but minded, but make yourselves equal to them of the lower sort. Be not wise in yourselves. Recompense no man evil for evil. Procure things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as in you is, have peace with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemies hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with goodness. This is the word of the Lord. We have confidence in this new world. The wise counsel of God is trustworthy. In Psalms 119, verse 105, Thy word is a lantern unto my feet, and a light unto my path. And then in 130, verse 119, The entrance into thy words showeth light, and giveth understanding to the simple. In this new world, this word is that lamp for our feet, and it's a light for our path that we know which way to go. God bless. As the psalm is sung, I'm going to help you in the echo. Let's stand together as we sing. Bow down thine ear, Jehovah, answer me. Bow down thine ear, Jehovah, answer me. For I am poor, afflicted, and needy. For I am poor, afflicted, and needy. Keep thou my soul. Merciful am I. Keep thou my soul, for merciful am I. My God, thy servant, save that trusts in thee. My God, thy servant, save that trusts in thee. In day of my straight tribulation. In day of my straight tribulation, I call on thee, for thou wilt answer me. I call on thee, for thou wilt answer me. Among the gods, not any is like thee. Among the gods, not any is like thee. O Lord, and like unto thy works are none. O Lord, and like unto thy works are none. Unto thy servant give thy strength and save. Unto thy servant give thy strength and stay. Thine handmaid son, a sign for good, show me. 
Thine handmaid, son, a sign for good show me. And let my haters see and shame it be. And let my haters see and shame it be. That I from thee, Lord, help and comfort have. That I from thee, Lord, help and comfort have. Now before we sing this next one, you know that the Ainsworth Psalter, what they did was they took psalms from the Geneva Bible and then they put them to verse. So you would not necessarily be reading the psalm just the way you would read it in the scriptures. They would change it and then they would put it in a metrical way so they could sing along with it. Now this one is called Old Hundred. It's the most famous of all the psalms sung by the pilgrims themselves. And it's one of the oldest. And of course, the, the melody itself became known eventually as the doxology. Shout to Jehovah all the earth. Shout to Jehovah all the earth. Serve ye Jehovah with gladness. Serve ye Jehovah with gladness. Before him come with singing mirth. Before him come with singing mirth. Know that Jehovah he God is. Know that Jehovah he God is. It's he that made us and not we. It's he that made us and not we. His folk and sheep of his feeding. His folk and sheep of his feeding. Oh, with confession enter ye. Oh, with confession enter ye. His gates, his courtyards with praising. His gates, his courtyards with praising. Confess to him, bless ye his name. Confess to him, bless ye his name. Because Jehovah he good is. Because Jehovah he good is. His mercy ever is the same. His mercy ever is the same. And his faith unto all ages. And his faith unto all ages. There were times in a pilgrim church service where the worship leader or the psalm leader would sing a psalm without antiphonal repeating. Bob will do that now. Confess Jehovah thankfully, for he is good for his mercy. Continueth forever. To God of gods confess do ye, because his bountiful mercy continueth forever. Unto the Lord of Lords confess, because his merciful kindness continueth forever. To him doth himself only things wondrous great for his mercy continueth forever. We now look to God's Word. And what I'm going to share with you are from the notes of John Robinson's farewell sermon to the pilgrims in Leiden, Holland, as they were about to get on the Speedwell, the only ship they were to own but only for a short time, and then depart. You must imagine the scene. Here, families have decided, and the church has voted, on who is going to leave. People had to make that choice. 
Some will be separated. Husbands will go to the new world and wives will wait behind. Some husbands and wives would go and then children would wait for a later boat to arrive. You can catch the scene of how sober that moment was. And I'm combining notes from his farewell sermon as well as his farewell letter given to the pilgrims as guidance. What would make you successful in the new world? Ezra 8, 21 and 22, I read to you, fellow congregants, we have no guarantee that we will ever see one another's face again like this. You all have chosen not only a courageous step of faith, but you've chosen the potential consequences as well. In Ezra the 8th chapter, and the 21st and 22nd verses, we read this. Then I proclaimed a fast at the river Ahava, that we might afflict ourselves before God and seek of him a right way for us and for our little ones and for all our substance. I was ashamed to require of the king a band of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy in the way because he had spoken unto the king, saying, The hand of our God is upon all them for good that seek him, but his power and his wrath is against all them that forsake him. We have not asked for help from any of those that were here for the guts, though many have given us so. We do not go and send from our church a remnant to go to the wilderness, and to go come what may, thinking that we're going to be helped on every side. No, like the writer, the penman, Ezra, it would be a shame for us as people of God to think that we need government aid or that we need help in such a way that we manipulate it or force it from other people. No, our goal is to depend on our God. And as God moves upon people's hearts, and they help us, yes, we join and we say thank you and we thank God. But we do not go on such a venture thinking that we're going to be aided by the hand of man. We are to search the scriptures to see if everything is so. I charge you before God and his blessed angels. Do not follow me any further than I follow Christ. The great danger in every movement that has happened in history, and especially the Reformation that we are in right now, the greatest danger is that people look more to the instrument of their Reformation and their leaders than they do to God and His Word. It is dangerous for you to have a loyalty toward individuals, even though you love me so and I love you. I urge you and I exhort you. You search the scriptures to think things are so and be ready to receive it from any new instrument or I am not going with you. I am leaving you. I am staying with the majority of the church here in Holland. The 75 of you sent out from a congregation of greater than 300 are to go and to learn to hear from God yourself. To not be dependent on others. Oh, thank God for the instruments that have led you in the right way. Thank God for the way you have been taught to teach and learn from Scripture. But I say to you, now put that to good use. For if you lean on me, you will do like others have done in our day. Oh, the Lutherans. How pitiful that they could not go beyond Luther. They constantly say that they would not accept anything unless Luther had written about it. Oh, and the Calvinists. Oh, another pity. They won't go beyond Calvin in the light that he had been given in his day. But I say to you, there's more light to break forth out of his holy word that we have not said and heard of yet. And yet you must seek the scripture. And you must not be bound and limited by the instrument of your reformation. 
Thank God for who he put in your life. But now seek God and his face and not just his hand and go before him. And I urge you, let scripture interpret scripture. Do not let ideas come outside of that book and then tempt you to change its meaning. Stay strong in the way God has led you. And be mindful of the covenant which we have made to God and to one another. I put you in mindful sobriety. We have covenanted with God. We have not just been blessed by God. We have committed our souls to God. And we've committed ourselves one to another whatsoever it should cost us. The Lord assisting us. Indeed, those are sober reminders. I say this, that it's not possible that the Christian world could have come completely out of anti-Christian bondage by this date. We have only had the scriptures in our own language for a few decades. What more will God do bringing forth his kingdom for those that seek his righteousness and have a Bible right in their heart to read to themselves and their children? So what will make you successful in this new world? What will cause you to be able to not just survive, but to thrive, to be victorious? I urge you to think of the following. You must never think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. You must recognize that only by the grace of God we go and we go forward. It is not us that has brought us here. It is God in spite of us and his mercy that has brought us here. It is not we who initiate choosing God in order to be able to follow him. It is he by his sovereign grace that has chosen us and given us the ability to follow him. And that maintains true humility. I say to you in that new world, daily, continually stay right with God. Confess your sins to him clearly and openly every day. Constantly go before him and ask for his forgiveness. Seek peace with all. Do not create divisions. Do not create things based on your personal preference. We seek peace, if at all possible, to live peaceably with all who are around us. If you gain peace with God on a daily basis, you will find it easier to be peaceful with one another. Even those people who are a bit corrigible, they're a bit strange, they rub you the wrong way. And God will be certain to give those people in your path that you might grow in your dependence upon him. Be an example, for you are not the only ones going on this boat. There are others that have been hired. There are strangers to the faith and strangers to our church. Why, they're not the ones that have covenanted, but you have. Do not look down on those that have not covenanted with God like you have. Do not look down on those that do not have the kind of commitment to one another like you have. No, draw them in by your example of character. Live out what you believe and then let the Holy Spirit draw them. Do not manipulate, do not force, do not think that by your own reasoning and your own force of will or words will draw them. Let your example be their guide. Seek the common good. What is best for all, not just you? What is the best that you can do for everyone? Whenever you make a decision, you must always remember, how will that decision affect the others that are in covenant with you? How will it affect the commonwealth beyond the church? For every decision you make and every action you take will always have consequences. And we are responsible for our actions and we're responsible to think ahead on what the consequences might be for those actions. And now I tell you, beloved church, you are not just to be the covenanted church that sends itself out and we send you out. 
to a wilderness where we know not what the future may hold. You are to become also a civil body politic. Using amongst yourselves civil government. And coming up from you, that civil government means that you are going to be in need of making sure that you seek the common good. Why you do not need to force people into the church? Why indeed, the civil covenant and compact is a jurisdiction set aside by God, distinct from the church, and yet it's out from the womb of the church. You extend that covenant now to the stranger and the saint at the same time, regardless of whether they are one with you in the church. In fact, you let your godliness appear by the way you choose your civil rulers. For you are the one that is to choose and to consent to those who pastor and shepherd among you. Why, it is your choice because God is the one that has instructed you so clearly. As I have written and as I have taught you, I have taught you this, that the leaders of the church, the elders among you, the pastors, the teachers, the deacons, and all of those among you, chosen by your consent to fulfill those duties, those individuals take a step down, not up, in fact, it's very clear that individuals in the church hold the highest position, for the Bible calls them kings and priests. Therefore, who they choose to be their rulers are washing the feet of kings. They wash the feet, and thus they take a step down unto service. So how must you choose those kinds of people? Who would want to take a step down? Why, most people in the church that we have left believe that once you're in leadership, you have privileges. You don't have to follow the same laws or rules as the others that voted you in, or in their case, they just got appointed to those positions. And those positions, by appointment, I warn you, to say that appointed positions with little accountability to the people get quickly corrupted and they end up following their own wishes and themselves and very seldom ever follow the common good. But it should not be so amongst you. You should choose those individuals who are willing to wash your feet in service, that are willing to take a step down, are willing to do less because those that are members of the church are kings, and those that are elders are servants of kings. Now, I know and you know that these words of mine, written and preached and sent back into England, have caused quite a stir. And you recognize that. In fact, they have come hunting for those among you here in Holland, and according to the Dutch authorities, some who could not help the pressure have begun to point out where we have worshipped and where we have been. And we know that our good brother, elder, has had to be in hiding. And you know who I speak about, but I shall not name. And we recognize that those individuals who have sought them out, why? Because they can't get over themselves in the position that they have. They love the position, not the people they're to serve. You shun such practice. And when you consent to civil rulers, you take the same pattern you do to church rulers, and you let your godliness appear. You do not vote people in based on the way they dress. You do not vote people in based on the way they talk. Vote in people who already served the common good before they had the position. And then you have a chance to say they'll continue serving. For some people, once they have a position, it just goes to their head so quickly they forgot what service is. But not amongst you. You shall choose those people that will honestly seek what's best for all and not what's best for them. And I say to you, beloved congregation, if you heed these words, you heed the fact that you serve God directly through Jesus Christ. You can read his word yourself. Thank God for the auspices and the time in which we live where we have the holy scriptures in the language we can read. 
read that word. Let it interpret itself. Stay humble before God. Confess your sins. Seek peace with all. Seek the common good in the church. Love the stranger by a good example of service into the light of Christ. And when you vote for civil office, use the same attributes you do for the church and begin to vote them in because of their previous service, not what they say when they're running for office. And if you do these things, then I tell you, you will be able to propagate and advance the gospel of the kingdom of Christ into those remote parts of the world. Yea, though you will be a stepping stone unto others for the performing of so great a work. May God bless his word and bless those among us we are about to lay hands on and send to the wilderness. Amen and amen. Pilgrims have a collection. Did the pilgrims raise money? Yeah, they did. And they did it, quite frankly, to support their families and to help people who are in financial trouble, inside and outside of the church. See, we pilgrims, we in New England, uh, are known for being frugal. In other words, we spend our money very tightly. And the reason for that is those two things. To support our families. To help people in need. So in New England, we're called frugal. In the rest of the country, we're called cheap. But so important, people. To guide what you do. To take what you have. Take what you earned. And do the right things with it. So uh, we did do that. Uh, and we did have sacraments. We had uh, communion and baptism. We had communion or the Lord's Supper on stated Sundays. And, uh, and we had baptism as it was needed, both adults and children, as they came to Christ. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for who you are. Thank you, God, for bringing us here where we need to be. And thank you for having us help us to practice the number one commandment, love God, love our neighbor, and love ourselves. Because we need to love. We need to show you. We need to show you to the rest of the world. As we go out to be stepping stones, we need to be stepping stones for you, not stepping stones for us. And we thank you for this incredible, incredible, incredible chance you've given us to come here to the new world and to do what we do to honor you and to spread your word. And we pray that you continue to bless us as you have blessed us so far. And you continue to have us love one another in this small loving community and let it go out to people who see us and watch us. We are representing you. God of glory, the creator. And we praise you, God, and we thank you. And we ask you to bless us. Send us out. Send us out in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Go in peace.